We're glad that you all could come today for our first training as part of our um, preventative health program. I'm Alex Miller and I'm a program manager with Ohio Chapter American Academy of Pediatrics. Today we'll be, we will be discussing immunizations, um, COVID-19, and then how to have those discussions with families. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Our next webinar is on March 23rd on developmental screenings at 12 p.m. With um, It's a collaboration with ACT Early. And then our April webinar is on trauma-informed care and ACEs on April 8th at 12.30. And you can register with the same link that you used to register for this training. And we also have a new resource that was created for this training. You will be able to access it on our preventative health program website. And I will send out an email afterwards. If you have any questions or comments during the training, please put them in the chat box and our presenters will get to them after they're done speaking. And if you have any trouble with the sound or the mic, please let us know in the chat box as well. If you could keep your video off and your lines muted so that our presenters can show their video and speak, that would be great. Our speakers today are Dr. Robert Frank and Dr. Lou Edgy. There's one CME and mostly part two credit available and I will send out a survey after this training for you to receive your credit and your certificate. And then I will go ahead and pass it off to Dr. Frank for him to get started. All right, so you want me to go ahead and start? Yes, go ahead. Okay, all right, let, uh, let me get here. Okay, so, so that, uh, welcome everybody. And mm -hmm. that, uh, yeah. Can, you hear okay? Okay. Um, yes, we can hear so you. that all right, I wouldn't sure. So that um, welcome everyone, and uh, as that was my disclosures there. So go through it. So that um, I'm watching my time here, so I don't uh, cut into Dr. Edgy's time because she uh, deserves all her time. And so what I'm going to do is just a little bit about the current epidemiology of COVID, and then discuss some of the clinical trials, and finally evaluate the ongoing safety and effectiveness measures of the vaccines. Um, and so one of the things I think that's really important is that we reframe the message a little bit, is that uh, I think there's been some confusion in the media um, about these two terms, because they, while they sound similar, they really are, from an infectious disease standpoint, very different. So infection means the ability to detect the organism in your body. So if you do a swab for COVID-19 and the PCR comes back positive, you're infected. But disease means infection with symptoms, so that you have not only a PCR positive, but you have a cough, or you have a runny nose, or you have fever, or whatever, respiratory distress. And then there's the spectrum of illness and, and the disease severity. And so what we're really trying to prevent is moderate to severe disease, and that translates to hospitalization or worse. So if we remember C stands for coronavirus, it, it, uh, and coronavirus provides uh, causes colds in almost everybody. And the reason COVID is different is because we didn't have any pre-existing immunity. But um, if I drew blood on any one of you, I probably would find antibodies against four or five different coronaviruses and you've had your coronavirus colds in the past. So if I could prevent all colds and that, that'd be wonderful. But what I'm really um, focused on with this vaccine is to prevent hospitalization or worse. So this slide is looking at the uh, number of cases by age. And so here is the incidence, whoops, the incidence uh, per 100,000, and then this is over time. And then the different colors here are represent the different age groups. So one of the things to look at is here in the initial part of the, the pandemic, the highest incidence was in the 75 plus. Um, now the lowest incidence is in the 75 plus, and that's because a lot of these people have been vaccinated. We also see here is these waves. Here's the wave that we saw during the uh, holiday period of 2020. Um, this is the Delta wave here, and then this is the Omicron wave. Um, and what I can say, at least from our hospital, I think that the Omicron wave is really starting to pass. We're getting a lot fewer calls about um, COVID outbreaks. This slide though is, is really one of the things that I really wanted to point out as far as with the vaccine and what it can do. And so here in the first place is looking at cases, so infections. Uh, again, per 100,000 and over time. And so this curve here is infections in unvaccinated people 
This is infections in vaccinated people. This is vaccinated plus boosted. And that, uh, so you can see, yes, there is an increase in cases um, during Omicron um, here in December and January of uh, this year. Um, but this then look at deaths. And here, this is the deaths in the vaccinated versus the deaths in the unvaccinated. And so that the rise in deaths that we're seeing is almost entirely in people that are unvaccinated. And so then to look at it another way, this is a, a slide that the CDC put out of comparing vaccinated and unvaccinated. So if you look at unvaccinated versus fully vaccinated, so that means you've had two doses of Pfizer or Moderna or one dose of Johnson & Johnson, you have a five time increased risk of testing positive if you're unvaccinated versus vaccinated and a 14 times risk increased risk of dying. If you then add in the booster, uh, it goes to 10 times increased risk of turn testing positive for COVID in the unvaccinated and a 20 times higher risk of dying. Um, actually, since I um, got this slide, um, the CDC even put out a, a more recent uh, data it was saying that 97 times increased risk of dying in the people that have been vaccinated and boosted compared to the people unvaccinated. Um, then moving a little bit then to the pediatric trials, the BNT16252 or otherwise the Pfizer vaccine um, that uh, been looking at three age groups uh, in descending ages, five to 11 years age, then two to five year age, and then six to months to 24 years. Um, in the first place, we did a dose uh, finding. So we looked at 10, 20, and 30 micrograms. The 30 microgram dose is the dose that was used in adults. Um, and then we backed down and that what we found um, for the part two is that we then used the, the dose that was the uh, optimal in part one. Uh, and what we found is that the 10 microgram dose for five to 11 year olds um, worked fine. Actually for the th uh, under five, it's actually been using three micrograms. Um, so this study was designed for um, safety and tolerability and then was called immunobridging. And that's what we've done for all of the pediatric trials under 16 is uh, to look at the immune response in the other age groups and compare them to the 16 to 25 year old group. And if they're the same, that's fine. Then you can say they're immunobridged. And so that you compare the immuno the efficacy that we have in the 16 to 25 year old, which is the 94, 95%. And that if you say that their immune responses are the same between the two groups, then the, the assumption is that the protective effect is the same between the two groups. Um, so for the five to 11 year olds, we enrolled about 2,500 children, uh, two to one to receive vaccine, like I said, the 10 microgram or placebo. Um, the adverse events that we saw were really mirrored of adolescent ad adult data. And as I was mentioning, the 10 microgram dose uh, was equivalent to the 30 microgram dose in the 16 to 25 year olds. So we could give one third the dose and get the same immune response. Um, there were only th three cases of COVID in vaccine recipients versus 16 in the placebo which translated to a vaccine efficacy of 91%, which basically is the same as we saw in um, adolescents and adults. Uh, and more importantly, that no cases of severe COVID or MISC were reported, but um, this is only 2,500 kids, so you really wouldn't expect to see either of those. Um, this is a slide looking at local reactogenicity. Um, again, the percentages uh, and then the symptoms of the top redness, swelling, or pain. This is dose one and dose two. What you can see is that pain is by far and away the most common. One of the uh, things though is it's important to look at is that we have a placebo, but to try to get an idea of you know, how common this is from the vaccine or is it just by getting a shot? So about a third of the kids complained of uh, pain just because they got a shot. This then is looking at systemic adverse events um, in the same group of kids. Again, the percentage of participants and across here, the symptoms. Um, and then in the first column is the vaccine recipients, the next one is placebo, and this is the second dose. What I can tell you is that we saw in the kids, the same thing we've seen in adolescents and adults is that the frequency of adverse events was higher in the second dose than it was in the first. But with this 10 microgram dose, even though it was the, do the frequency was higher in the second dose compared to the first, the frequency of adverse events was much lower in the five to 11 year olds than we saw in the um, 12 and above. And so this is another thing too, just to show people why you need a placebo. As far as if you look at fatigue here, or you look at headache, is that the percentage kids that had um, headache or fatigue in the uh, placebo group was almost the same as it was in the vaccine group. Um, this is then looking at the um, antibody titer. And so this is the titer in the five to 11 year olds. 
it was 1197 versus 16 to 25 year olds is 1146. And so if you divide this number by this number, you end up getting the 1.04, which says basically that the, the titers between the two groups were equivalent. And so even though we gave one third the dose in the five to 11 year olds, we got the same immune response. Um, and then this is the some data from uh, Kids Cove uh, that there's really not a, anything published yet. Um, and so this is just from the uh, clinicaltrials.gov is that's been done. I can tell you we're doing the trials too for this and that they're down into the six months to two years of age um, using the 25 and 50 micrograms. 100 micrograms uh, was too reactogenic in the kids, so it hasn't been used in the children, it's just the 25 and 50 micrograms. Um, but it's very similar design as Pfizer is having the um, first doing a phase one to find the dose and then a phase two um, having they use three to one vaccines to uh, placebo. And they were looking at approximately the same numbers, about 1700 in the younger, uh, in the older age group, and then 2000 in each of the younger age groups. Since this slide was made or came off of clinicaltrials.gov, actually the FDA has asked uh, Moderna to do more kids so that there is a bit higher number in, in this also is Pfizer. So, but the outcome measures were the same of looking at for the um, Pfizer. So then switching then from efficacy, which is what we do in a clinical trial, and so when we control things very closely, to effectiveness. And I think that's really important because effectiveness is how things work in a real world setting. So people are supposed to come every 21 days, but in reality they came every, they came in 27 days or 32 days or whatever. So um, to see how the vaccine works in the real world setting. Um, there were about 4,000 people in this one study that was reported in New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, about 3,200 of them had one dose of vaccine and 2,700 had two doses of vaccine. It just so happened that two thirds were Pfizer and one third Moderna. Um, and then they self swabbed weekly for COVID-19. They had 204 of these people that developed COVID and only five of those were in vaccinated personnel. So the vaccine effectiveness ended up being 91%. And so really the effectiveness and the efficacy data came out the same. And that oftentimes does not happen. Oftentimes the effectiveness is much lower than the efficacy. Um, the other important finding I thought from this study is that the viral load in the uh, vaccinated people that got COVID was 40% lower than in the people that um, had COVID and were not vaccinated. So the vaccine, even if it didn't totally prevent infection, which it did 91% of the time, even in those few people that got vaccinated, their viral load is much lower. Um, and then this is another study looking um, at uh, vaccine efficacy, the MMWR put out the CDC. And if you look here at the end, as far as that the unadjusted vaccine efficacy, that's VE was 94%, 92% of you adjusted it if you're taking, comparing unvaccinated to either partially vaccinated or fully vaccinated. So again, the effectiveness was just as good as the efficacy. Um, this is another study published at the end of last year. Um, and then here's looking at um, the effectiveness of the uh, vaccine in adolescents. And so this was a, a study that the CDC did for active surveillance of 12 to 18 year olds in 31 hospitals in 23 states. Um, was conducted between May and October of last year. They had 445 cases, um, uh, case patients and 777 controls. Of the 17 case patients, 4% were um, vaccinated versus 282 controls, 36% had been fully vaccinated. 96% um, of the hospitalized patients and 99% of the patients that needed life support were not fully vaccinated, basically weren't vaccinated at all. Um, and so in the end, I say, look at this here, the effectiveness of the vaccine against hospitalization in adolescents is 94%, against ICU admission is 98%, against re requiring life support 98%, against death was 100%. There was, thank goodness, there was a low death rate. It was zero though in the vaccines versus seven and unvaccinated. What I would take out of this is the effectiveness in the adolescents been equivalent as what we saw in uh, efficacy in adults. Then moving a little bit to um, side effects, because this is one of the things people have uh, been concerned about is the myocarditis. Um, so myocarditis sounds bad as far as the swelling of the heart muscle, um, but the myocarditis with the vaccine has really been quite mild and has been rare. Um, the CDC has been estimating it's about four per 100,000 uh, administ uh, doses administered in children 12 to 15 years of age following the second dose of the mRNA vaccine. We really haven't seen it after the first dose, it's almost all after the second dose. Uh, there was another database from Canada um, reported very similar kind of findings that they found for the Pfizer vaccine is four per 100,000 and the Moderna vaccine is about 26 per 100,000. So it was a bit higher in the Moderna versus the Pfizer, but still quite low. 
Um, and some of this may be uh, a bias for data ascertainment bias. And that's, so it's somewhere uh, about, uh, all in that same range of somewhere between four, maybe 10 per 100,000, I would say. So low. Um, this is a, a study then the um, CDC also did as far as a retrospective chart review of 16 hospitals in patients less than 21 years of age. And what they did, they're looking at what they called CVAM, and that's the COVID um, vaccine associated myocarditis is what they called it CVAM. Um, and so that they based that on the clinical presentation, abnormal biomarkers and cardiovascular imaging within two weeks of the vaccination. Um, they found 63 cases, 92% in males, so very similar to what was found in the other epidemiology studies, and all but one case presented after the second dose. So again, very similar to found in uh, previous studies. The important thing also is that, the, again, showing that the hospital case was mild uh, with a quick clinical recovery and excellent, excellent short-term outcome. Many of the people didn't even really require hospitalization. So one of the things people, though, need to remember is that while the vaccine can cause myocarditis, the virus also can cause myocarditis and it can cause severe myocarditis. So in the United States, patients with COVID-19 is nearly a 16 times higher risk for myocarditis compared uh, in the COVID-19 compared to the background rate. And if you look at myocarditis in the virus associated versus the vaccine associated, it's nearly seven times higher risk for myocarditis in people that got natural infection versus those who got vaccines. Um, and then this is um, some uh, what's called uh, post-approval post, uh, uh, marketing surveillance. And so the CDC has a system called VAERS, the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. There was also a specific system that was set up for COVID called VSAFE. Um, and that was where the parents would enroll their children and then actively report any um, symptoms they had. Um, so this reporting period happened between November and 3rd and December 19th of last year, and it accounted for about 8.7 million doses of vaccine have been having been administered to five to 11 year olds. Um, VAERS had received 4,249 reports, um, but almost all of those were not serious. So 97.6% were not serious um, and be safe. Um, they had 57% uh, of their uh, reports were local and 12,223 uh, were systemic. Uh, so the, and this, the adverse events that they were found were basically the same that we found in the clinical trial. So nothing new. Uh, and the other thing too, is that myocarditis in this group was very rare. Um, the, in VAERS, they found 11 cases in 8 million doses. So about one in a million. Um, and in the active sur hospital surveillance, there were zero cases and that 335,000 children had been monitored. So I don't know exactly why in the five to 11 year old, the uh, myocarditis is less. Um, maybe it's age related, maybe it's dose related because remember we're giving uh, 10 micrograms instead of 30 micrograms. But what I can tell you is that the vaccine in the five to 11 year olds has been incredibly safe. It's in safe in all of the groups, but it's even safer in the five to 11 year old. So this is one of the things that uh, I think has been important too, as far as that has shifted, as far as our um, teaching and that about vaccines since we started. So when Dr. Edgy and I first started talking about um, vaccines and with COVID, uh, the emphasis really was about racial disparity, that we were having very big differences uh, depending on a racial background as far as immunization rates. Those racial disparities across the United States as a whole have pretty much disappeared. Um, if you look at the immunization rates in blacks or browns or uh, whites, it's basically the same. Um, the Asian, the rate in the Asian population actually was the highest, um, but uh, uh, for overall, the, the rates were pretty much the same. But what we're seeing now is the difference is by age. And so as you look here, this is going from five to 11 up to 75 plus. As you go down in age here, you also go down in the percentage of people that have been vaccinated. And so now our worst vaccination rate are down here in the children and young adults. Um, and that this isn't a coincidence that the action is in the group that is the lowest incidence of immunization. And so to, as the last slide uh, to say where are we at. So COVID vaccines, um, 19 vaccines have a good safety profile and protection against disease. We now have three vaccines available through the Emergency Use Authorization, or EUA. Uh, the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccines are now available for five and above. 
Moderna has submitted their data for the 12 to 18 to the FDA, and they're still reviewing that. Um, the trials for children under five are ongoing. And since the time that I made this slide, which is three weeks ago, I had to amend it from where I initially had said EUA for children under five may be, I thought my crystal ball said would occur by um, early summer, late spring. Now it looks like it may well end up being by the end of this month um, that the advisory committee for the FDA of Verpac is meeting on Tuesday, uh, next Tuesday, and that uh, if they give a recommendation to extend the EUA, then the FDA would make their recommendation, then it would move on to the um, ACIP, which is the advisory committee for immunization practice, uh, advisory committee to the CDC, and then the CDC give a recommendation. So it's possible that a vaccine uh, by EUA would be available for six months and above uh, as early as the end of this month. Uh, that vaccine dose would be three micrograms, and I think it's most likely end up being a three dose series um, because the if we give 10 micrograms to the kids under five, uh, we do get a good immune response, but it had too much reactogenicity, so you had to drop it down to three micrograms. And I think with that, I am done. And that uh, just a couple of pictures of our participants in trials, and that I will stop and turn it over to Dr. Hedgie. And I left you an extra minute, Dr. Edgy. Thank you, I appreciate that. Can you see my slide yet? I see your slide. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you for that um, wonderful uh, update, Dr. Frank. Um, my um, approach is going to be a, a smidge different. I was asked to really talk about how to communicate to families and to translate some of that um, excellent science um, that Dr. Frank just talked about um, to parents, because really the, um, the best conversations are the ones that actually result in um, people getting vaccinated. So uh, let's see. Okay, so my background, I'm from the University of Michigan. I teach residents and fellows and um, work at University of Cincinnati um, and I'm a family physician. So my objectives really are to go over five different strategies to enhance communication with families. Um, one, to know your audience, to anticipate their questions, to translate the science, to combat misinformation and to amplify your message. And then um, to go over some of the um, resources that we have available. So number one, knowing your audience. Um, the CDC actually states that women are the chief medical officers of our families um, because um, according to CDC data, 79% uh, uh, of women pick the, family, the family's physician, 77 make the medical visit appointments, and then 59 actually make the medical decisions um, that affect the family. If we look at Kaiser Family Foundation data, and this was um, from the tail end of 2021, um, nearly half of parents said that their um, 12 to 17 year olds have, have gotten the vaccine, but a third of them said that they would not get their, their teen vaccinated. And we'll talk a little bit about why. Um, so it's, again, it's important for us to know what our audience is thinking um, to decide how we tackle the conversations. Um, this information is, um, again, also about 12 to 17 year olds, and a larger share of patient, uh, parents say now that they will go ahead and get their um, 12 to 17 year olds vaccinated. If you see here, January 22, um, it's 61% that um, say that the child is vaccinated. The interesting thing here is that the definitely will not get vaccinated group has pretty much stayed the same. If you look at April 21, it was 22% who said that they would absolutely not. And then January 22, we're at 23%. Um, the other thing to know is, you know, the political component of the folks that you're talking to. And what we do know is that half of Democrats choose um, the pandemic being the biggest concern, uh, where Republicans really are more concerned um, in this particular um, uh, slide uh, with inflation. So less concerned about the pandemic itself. If we look at Black and Hispanic adults, Democrats are, uh, and them, it's, it's much more likely that they're going to go ahead and um, use masks. And so if you look here, we've got a trend from July 21, um, going by a grocery store, indoors in a crowded uh, place, uh, in a public transportation at work and then outdoors. And again, if you look at 
um, the race and ethnicity, um, Black individuals are much more likely to go ahead and wear their masks to a grocery store versus 40% of 47% of white. If you look at the Democrats, um, 83 versus 30% of Republicans, again, this is the grocery store, and then vaccinated versus unvaccinated, unfortunately, the most um, virulent um, folks would be uh, less likely to mask. And you can look at the rest of this data here. Um, public transportation, for example, um, if you look at uh, the Democrats, that's the middle column there, Democrats are much more likely to be wearing their mask on public transportation. If you look at what worries low income parents um, about getting their kids vaccinated, one of the issues uh, is fertility in particular. And so if you look at the third uh, row down, the COVID-19 vaccine may negatively impact their child's fertility in the future. So as you start to think about the discussions that you have, being able to address how um, having COVID-19 affects fertility or does not affect fertility would be an important part of that discussion. And you know, also at the very top here, not enough is known about the long-term effects of uh, the vaccine. Uh, if you're able to understand this about your audience, then um, going into the conversation with tools to address these issues is important. And then this is uh, more recent. This is actually just from the last part of January, um, nearly after two years of um, the COVID-19 pandemic, who is tired and frustrated and uh, probably more likely to um, not be masking, et cetera. Um, we can see that it's actually fairly even um, for folks. Um, more than seven to 10, uh, seven out of 10 adults actually um, are, are tired and frustrated as we'd expect. Um, that is a duplicate. Okay, so anticipating their questions. So one of the biggest concerns I think for my young uh, patients and their parents is, is my action or inaction gonna harm my child now or in the future? I think that's the, the bottom line for most. Um, reassure me so I don't have any regrets down the line. And so they're coming in for reassurance about their decisions. So common questions that I've had, number one, if COVID is mild in most kids, why should I vaccinate? Um, what are common side effects for kids? What kids are at highest risk and should get vaccinated as soon as possible? Um, so to answer the first one, if, if COVID is mild in most kids, why vaccinate? Well, it's safe, and it's, as we um, just mentioned, it's 91% effective. Um, for your five to 11 year olds. And at the time that we had done this, 700 kids had already died of COVID. Actually with adults, we're at um, 2,500 per day, um, which is up from a thousand about a month and a half ago. And there's an FDA prediction model for every 1 million kids vaccinated that prevents 58,000 cases of COVID, 241 hospitalizations with severe COVID, 77 ICU admissions. And then on a practical note, me being a parent, although my kid just graduated from college, um, unvaccinated kids who are exposed to COVID, um, you don't have to end up doing quarantine for them, okay? So your time off work, um, unscheduled time off work ends up being a difficult thing um, if you're continually having to take time off for um, even exposures. What are the common side effects for kids? Very similar to adults, but milder, um, frequently fatigue, low fever, uh, low grade fever, muscle aches, joint aches, um, mild headaches, and then injection site soreness as, as we already saw. Um, kids that are higher risk and should be vaccinated as soon as possible, again, similar to adults, those who are diabetic, obese, those who have asthma, immunocompromised status, either um, primary or acquired sickle cell disease patients as well. Translating the science, one thing that I found helpful um, is to try and uh, use analogies. And there are four that I'm just going to briefly touch on and certainly um, I found useful. So key in a changing lock, we'll talk about that one, icing on the cake, safety deposit box, and Snapchat message. So the change, the key in a changing lock is for the, I'm going to wait to get vaccinated, meaning there's not enough data out there. I want to see what happens as more people get vaccinated. Um, fortunately, we've got a fair amount of data that's out there um, in the real world at, outside of trials. Um, but if you think about the virus as a lock and the vaccine as a key, what we don't wanna do is to end up having um, a, such a large number of people that are not vaccinated that we have to change our key and that our, our current vaccines are not as, as useful as they had been. The icing on the cake is for the vaccine was developed way too fast. And for this, um, I use the cake um, and icing 
issue. Number one, uh, the two cakes really are a decade each of science behind um, coronavirus um, viruses. And really it took us 66 days to determine um, you know, what we needed to do to develop the vaccine and, and deal with the spike protein. And um, so that really, it's not just been uh, at the time, you know, 66 days that we developed um, that we've been learning about this vaccine and developing. It's really been a lot of a long runway of history um, to vaccines uh, in this category for coronaviruses. Um, the safety deposit box question, this is really an analogy for those who are concerned about fertility. Um, I'm concerned the vaccine will affect my fertility. And for this one, um, DNA um, is, is really like a safety, locked in a safety deposit box, the nucleus of the cell and the mRNA um, in the Pfizer Moderna vaccines don't have access to that safety deposit box. Um, and therefore there is not um, a fertility issue there. Um, concern that the vaccine will have harmful side effects on my body long-term. And so this one, you know, I don't use Snapchat, but a lot of folks do. So um, Snapchat messages are messages that are out there. They only last um, for a few minutes and then they're gone. Uh, the same thing with the mRNA um, vaccine technology. In fact, they have a lipid nanoparticle that, that is enveloping um, you know, the, vac the particle um, so that it actually will go ahead and not uh, break down um, in the, the muscle tissue. Um, but then it's, it's gone. And so the harmful effects um, so far that we've been able to find um, from the vaccine are very minimal. As far as combating misinformation, uh, things to note, um, depending upon what the news source is that you listen to or your audience is listening to, the people who you're talking to about vaccines, you'll note that there is a higher um, incidence of belief in um, false information if individuals are um, getting their news from Newsmax, One American News, Fox News at the top of the list, and less likely with um, CNN and News Network News and NBC at the bottom and NPR in the middle. One third um, believe or are unsure about four more false statements about COVID-19. And this is comparing um, vaccinated versus unvaccinated. The unvaccinated are much more likely to believe false statements. Um, Republicans and independents more, than, more so than Democrats and rural more so than urban and suburban. Amplifying your message. Um, definitely having catalytic partnerships with folks can who can amplify your message is important. So um, partnering with community leaders. Uh, I know that we ended up having um, a, write, a letter writing campaign um, to try and make sure that there was masking in schools and had um, 450 physicians um, who went ahead and, and got involved with that. We also had all uh, black physicians in Cincinnati area go ahead and write a letter to um, the black community to try and implore them to get vaccinated. Um, and the Cincinnati Medical Association, which is primarily Black and Latinx physicians, um, is also um, one who's been instrumental in, in moving things forward in, in those populations. Certainly faith leaders, local businesses, and schools as well. Um, your primary care physician, top of the list as far as trust, as far as uh, um, the data goes. Again, getting involved. I've had an opportunity to be involved in a bunch of different things. I'm just going to click through these. But... Um, we have a case, and this is Darlene. She's a well-educated, fully vaccinated and boosted mother of three living in rural Kentucky. Her mother, husband, and two um, a twin five-year-old sons are vaccinated. She does have a 13-year-old daughter, Francesca, um, whom she's on the fence about getting vaccinated. So I'm gonna just leave it open for um, you to discuss what you think. Um, unmute if you can. How would you handle this particular case? How would you approach this mother? I know there's a brave soul out there. How would you approach this mother trying to, to reassure her, get her, her daughter Francesca vaccinated? So what I've, I'll be brave, Dr. Edgy, I'll ask <laughs> as far as it, what I've found a lot of times is to ask what's worrying her or what concerns her. Yeah, that, I think- why, why are you on the fence? Exactly, exactly. Um, so as we talked about knowing your audience, so she is, and I'm just going to head back for a second. She's fully vaccinated. Great. She's a mother. So we know that this is the right person in the family we should be talking about just because the percentage of folks that are making a lot of the decisions um, are, are the mothers. 
rural Kentucky. So we know Kentucky tends to be a red state, rural area, also higher risk um, for not being interested in getting vaccinated. So those two things are important. Um, so anticipate their questions. Again, she's a teenager, so we know fertility is an issue. Translating the science, you probably want to try and pick something that you can, um, you know, using a lot of the, the medical jargon, um, sometimes it's not useful for a patient. Um, combating misinformation and then amplifying your message. So as Dr. Frank said, trying to find out, you know, what is it um, that she's concerned about? So number one, encouraging the fact that the majority of her family is vaccinated, that's a huge plus and probably already helping to protect Francesca to some extent, but certainly not optimally. Um, and then do you mind explaining what you mean by on the fence? Because she was like on the fence. So hopefully um, on the fence means she's, she's sort of open um, and you can go ahead and then figure out what is the best way to discuss this. Sounds like sh because of the patient's age that fertility may be the big issue. Um, and then provide resources and we'll look at some of those in a little bit. So uh, certainly this is one um, place to get resources. The website, Kaiser Family Foundation Vaccine Monitor has some great stuff. Again, more from the perspective of what are people's feelings out there? What are they thinking about the vaccine and immunity and so on? Um, this is somebody who I follow, um, Dr. Hotez. I, I follow him on Twitter. He does a great job with um, bite-sized information. The CDC um, has gotten some flack for um, you know, trying to explain some of the science and have policy positions, but their data is still extremely strong and important. Ohio Department of Health, of course. And then if we look at this page, you can go to um, ohioaap.org and then go to COVID-19 resources and click on that. And there's a whole section there for parents, providers, and so forth that you can click on and get information like this that I have here. Um, again, this is Dr. Hotez, one of his. Um, and I'd like to just say this quote here, um, education must enable one to sift and weigh evidence to discern the true from the false, the real from the unreal, and the fact from the fiction. I think that's really our biggest charge is to make sure that um, as healthcare professionals um, and those who have um, knowledge to go ahead and, and translate that and make people feel comfortable about making their own independent decisions um, that are best for their family. So I'm going to stop sharing. That's all I had. And go ahead. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Frank and Dr. Edgy. Um, we will take time now for questions. Um, I know that there was one question for Dr. Frank in the chat box, and it was any information on the Pfizer for the six month to four years old. We are now to order this vaccine and I have not heard much about this age group. Um, so you haven't heard much about the age group because we were still um, finishing up the clinical trials and that, uh, um, but the uh, FDA has asked that Pfizer um, submit the data to them so they can review it for uh, what they're calling a rolling EUA. So be looking at first the, the two dose series, but I think it's probably, as I mentioned before, a three dose series. It's gonna be a three microgram dose. So it's gonna be a bit confusing as far as there's going to be a three microgram dose for the under five, then there's going to be a 10 microgram dose for the five to 11, and then a 30 microgram dose from 12 and above. So um, that's obviously not ideal for stocking in the refrigerator uh, or freezer, but that's where we're going to be. Um, I think that the, so what'll happen is that um, the uh, Verpac will make their recommendation next week and then the FDA um, makes their recommendation based on their advisory committee, um, and then the CDC makes a recommendation for use, uh, so that I think it could be that there would be vaccine available to the end of the month, uh, maybe. Uh, you know, it, I don't know how quickly Pfizer has the things produced. Uh, it, one of the nice things about this vaccine, you can produce it pretty quickly. Um, and they've learned a lot about the supply chain, so it probably wouldn't be that long, but uh, to get it once approval's uh, uh, done. But that uh, I would say that late this month, early next month is probably about the soonest you're going to see it in the community. Great, thank you. Are there any other questions?
So don't ask me about the score for the Bengals game because I didn't do too well predicting when the six month to five year old five year old uh, vaccine would be available. So you probably don't uh, want, to, want to know my prediction on the. Uh, oh, no. You don't have to predict the score. You just have to predict that they're going to win. Ah, okay, okay, okay. That'll be yes. easier. There you go. Well, great. Well, if any other questions come up, um, please feel free to email me, and I can get those questions to Dr. Eddie. Or oh. There's when it says uh, who will be given injection to under, I mean, I'm not sure if you mean like a health department versus doctor's office versus a nurse or what I'm, uh, I think the co, so if somebody from ODH could help me with this, but I believe that um, before COVID that for a pharmacist to give a vaccine, it was 12 and above, but now with COVID it's um, gone down to six. So if that was the question i think it would end up having to be in a um some sort of a medical home either the health department or uh doctor's uh office um i, I believe that is where the bottom line was was six for the um pharmacist but i'm not positive on that um but the good thing is is that now the vaccine can be stored in a refrigerator for at least a week um so just a regular refrigerator for at least a week the pfizer vaccine so you don't need that ultra cold um, we have had more chance to get uh, um, stability data. So that that allows um, ODH to be able to get the vaccine out to sites a little bit easier. Um, and yes, I would agree with Dr. I mean, the place we want to have kids get their vaccine or everybody get their vaccine is in their in their home, in their back, in their uh, medical home. One of the things that we didn't talk about this, um, but it's one of the things that's been one of the of many very unfortunate consequences of COVID is that um, routine childhood visits have dropped off and uh, routine child vaccination rates have dropped off. We're starting to get better, but we're still lagging. So that uh, as Dr. Edgy was saying, is getting kids back into their medical homes is really a, a huge priority. Any other questions? Well, thank you all so much for joining. And thank you again to Dr. Edgy and Dr. Frank for speaking um, on immunization. So we're glad we could have that update and um, some ways that we can have discussions with families. And I will be sending a follow-up email this week with the link to the survey to receive your certificate and CME um, credit, as well as the new resource that we have created. And the recording for the webinar as well. If there are any questions, please feel free to contact me and my email is listed there. And we are so glad that you were all able to come and hopefully you can register for the next training in March. Do you have something else, Dr. Frank? So Alex, I was just going to say one other thing is that to follow up along with what Dr. Edgy was saying is that mm -hmm. the other thing that I found very effective is use stories. You know, tell them about why the vaccine is important to you. I mean, what have you done for your family? Have you vaccinated? You know, what have you seen? Because that emotional connection can be really important too, um, that people are then seeing you as living, breathing human beings that have emotions and feelings uh, just like mm -hmm. they do and, and, that, uh, and you make a connection. And if you make a connection, you have a lot better chance of um, getting people to be able to listen to you. So making that initial connection, however you need to do it as far as, but, you know, telling stories is one of the things that I've found as far as for just vaccines in general. When I was growing up, it was having the polio vaccine and telling people about what I saw with kids getting polio just in my lifetime and that, and that we don't see that anymore. So don't be afraid to use your experiences and, and, your, um, and your stories because they really are important.